Hello all, and welcome to our first Creepypasta collection. Today, we recount five truly chilling Creepypastas with some friends of mine. So get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. These past few weeks have been some of the most stressful ones of my life. Maybe that's why I'm finally starting to see him. I christened him Mortimer after it was apparent that he wasn't going to go anywhere anytime soon. I began seeing him at least three times a day. At first, Mortimer wasn't anything. He was a shapeless slither of a shadow, no dimensions or form. I find him sitting in chairs, standing in doorways, or holding objects in his matter. Whenever I saw him, my senses would go limp, my muscles would stiffen, and then I'd lose sense in them altogether. For the first time in months, I felt bliss. My eyelids would shut, and for a few precious seconds, I would feel as if nothing mattered anymore. I wasn't Edward, I wasn't human, I wasn't even alive, just a teeny ball of pure nirvana for just a few moments. Then it was over and I would find myself doing whatever Mortimer had been doing, sitting in the same chair, standing in the same doorway or holding the same thing that had been in his shadowy grasp a few moments ago. The first time I did this, I was startled. Then it became my sole escape. Every time I let myself drift into Mortimer's perpetual ecstasy, it lasted a few moments longer. I found that, if I put my mind to it, I could resist the temporary neurological shutdown my brain underwent, but I rarely, if ever, did. I had a job as well. I spent most of the day typing up reports and spreadsheets, making sure the company didn't go out of budget on the various expenditures it engaged in. A motion at the corner of my eye caught my attention. Ricky, one of my co-workers, was walking towards the men's room. As he entered the bathroom, I noticed Mortimer at the door as well. I felt my grasp on reality fade away, and I welcomed it with open arms. When I re-entered the material world, I was sitting at my computer as if I hadn't gone anywhere. The report was finished. It was closing time. As I left the office, Mortimer was sitting in the driver's seat of the car, at the opposite end of the parking lot. I let myself go again, and found myself immediately in the driver's seat, the buzz of bliss still tangible at the back of my head. I had noticed something. Before I evaporated into my ethereal state, Mortimer was no longer a shapeless shadow. He had taken form. A diminutive figure with thin appendages and a rotund belly, his skin hairless except for a few thorny growths, and a slick with fluid. That detail nagged me the whole drive home. Dissipating the euphoric tingle that jolted down my spine. The next morning was Saturday. I woke up eagerly, not for the holiday, but for a chance to experience utter bliss once more. I looked out of the window. Mortimer glanced up with his wet, scarred face. Not at my eyes, but into my chest. Straight through to my heart. He was seated in the car. What felt to me like moments later I was in his place. I drove along aimlessly until I encountered, by chance, my parents' large luxury home. Father had died a couple of years back, but he died a rich businessman, and mother, with the money, hired a world-leading architect to design her house right in the richest part of the city. Yet not one cent of that money had seen by my empty bank account. Mother, unlike what she did with her son, didn't spare any expense on security. A network of CCTV cameras and four guards, each of whom took 12-hour shifts in pairs to cover the entire day. 
They knew me and let me visit anytime I wanted, but I never found any reason to. Mother had always tried to get me out of her life, and like always, she succeeded. It was fine by me, but this time, Mortimer was standing at the gate. That was the first time I have ever felt confused before drifting off. I was even more bewildered when I woke up back in my car. The only thing that had changed being the time of day and the position of the guards. The whole drive back to the house, I was on edge. What had I done at mother's place? Sunday morning came around, and that day I learned everything. When I looked up from my tear-sodden palms, Mortimer was squatting in front of me. Why? A simple question. You're wondering why I came into your life all of a sudden. Made you do all these horrible, horrible things. He laughed, a dry, throaty laugh. I am you, child. I am what tells you right from wrong. This hideous creature in front of you that your heart has forged. With that, he lifted a slender finger and tapped my chest. It felt as if a dam had burst inside my mind. All the viscera of a suppressed personality flowed into the labyrinth maze of my mind. Judgments, thoughts, and emotion that justified my actions made them rational, rid of me of my sorrow. And with that, Mortimer disappeared from my life. Before I ever knew Mortimer, my fiancé used to hate me. She hated the fact that we lived in almost poverty, that there was no funding to back her insane, extravagant fashion sense. She only stuck with me like a pile of crap that won't flush because no other man would sink that low. And also because she held on to the sliver of hope that one day, my mother would bite the dust and then... me. Now, she said she loved me, she wanted to get married. Plates no longer crashed against the side of my head. Scratch mark never wound their way down the length of my arm. But it wasn't genuine. She loved me because of what happened today. My boss called to tell me that I had earned the promotion I had been dreaming about for months. It didn't make a difference though, because the offices were set to close down due to the fact that Ricky Gerald's, my competitor for the promotion, had been found dead in the men's room. But that wouldn't matter, because my mother solicitor had called me as well. Mother had died suddenly due to unknown circumstances, and I was to inherit what was left of father's fortune, which was still substantial enough for me to live a comfortable life. We were sleeping, or at least my fiancé was. She caressed my torso with her hands, curled up close to me. That was fine. It just made it easier was a thought that crossed my mind as I slowly pulled the steak knife out of the pillowcase. Daddy loves me very much. Daddy made me my own pair of braces for my fifth birthday. Daddy told me not to show it to anyone, not even at school. Daddy said if I did, the bad man would come out and hurt me. Daddy's braces were really cool. I saw them before they went into my mouth. It was all grey and hard and my mouth felt really cold when they went in. Daddy told me if I opened my mouth they would hurt real bad. He was right. Daddy's right about everything. Daddy made my braces have cool little pointy spikes on it. I really like them, but it makes my mouth bleed. Daddy told me if I opened my mouth they would tear holes through my cheeks. I never opened my mouth. Daddy told me I was a good boy, and good boys don't open their mouths. Daddy wanted me to be a good boy, so he used a safety clip inside my mouth so it would be hard to open. He rubbed salt on the metal bit too. It hurts, but I'm a good boy. At school, my teachers were really worried about me. I liked Miss Johnson, but I think she was scared of me. She was scared because I didn't talk like other kids. I wanted Miss Johnson to like me, so I asked Daddy after he took the clip off after I went home if I could take the braces off and talk to the other kids. The bad man came out. 
Daddy told me the bad man made my head hurt after I woke up. Daddy told me I was a bad boy. The braces made me bleed a lot. I couldn't open my mouth at school, so I had to swallow. When I came home and used the toilet, it would be red. It smelled like metal too. Daddy said the bad man would come if I didn't clean the bowl. He did. One day when I came home, there were policemen outside my house. I wanted to go inside, but a policeman grabbed me. The policeman was very nice. He asked me who I was, but I didn't open my mouth. Daddy told me not to open my mouth to policemen. The policeman told me to go home, and I tried to go inside again. The policeman took me away in his car. I cried. I wanted my daddy, but I didn't open my mouth. I was really happy when they took me to daddy. He was sitting behind some glass. I ran to hug him, but another policeman stopped me. He asked me if this was my daddy. Of course he was, so I nodded. Then he took me away from daddy. I cried again. The policeman said that he wanted to ask me something, and then I could see daddy again. He asked me a lot of questions, but I couldn't answer. He told me that daddy couldn't hurt me here. I was confused. Daddy didn't hurt me. The bad man did. I thought the policemen got mixed up. I pointed to my mouth to tell the nice policeman that I was a good boy and that good boys don't open their mouths. The policeman tried to open my mouth. I screamed and blood went everywhere. He screamed too. I didn't see him again. A police lady took me to a doctor. I was confused because I wasn't sick. When I woke up, my mouth didn't feel cold. I could open my mouth. I cried because I was a bad boy now. The bad man would hurt me. This time two policemen asked me questions. I told them about the bad man who would hurt me if I opened my mouth and how my daddy would save me. I told them that daddy wanted to make me a good boy and that good boys shouldn't open their mouths. I told them that I was a bad boy. One policeman asked me why daddy gave me the braces. That was an easy question. Questions at school are much harder. I told the policeman that my daddy didn't want me talking about the kids he kept in the basement, the kids that he played with every night. I told them that I was sad because I never got to play with the kids. Miss Johnson told me that sharing is caring. The policeman lied. I never got to see my daddy again, but I know he still loves me. It was supposed to be an easy job. Walk in, grab anything that looked like it could sell, and walk out. I guess you could say I'm a sort of repo man. Clients call me up, give me the address and what they want, and if the item is in satisfactory condition when I give it back to them, they fork over the cash. Most of the time I can pill for anything else I take a fancy to, but sometimes people want a discreet job. Grab whatever shit they want, leave anything else. Those jobs I charge a lot more. This was one of them. 6 a.m. Walked into the rendezvous point, a small Starbucks joint tucked away in the street corner. Fifteen minutes later, a client walks in. Old guy, balding, a sort of dead look in his gray-blue eyes. He had bags under his eyes like he hadn't slept in quite a while. Probably why I was at a Starbucks and not down the alleyway like usual. So the job? I asked. He awkwardly sat down. Straight to business then, he raised his eyebrows. Most hustlers flaunt a bit beforehand. Get the clients riled up. He's done this before. Shit. No room for haggling. I'm not here to show off my junk. This is work, not the strip club. He laughed. Sounded like the guy had 15 different assortments of cancer. Right then. This job's an apartment in the city. Shady place. It's called the Yorker Brewery. The apartment number? You'll be looking for apartment B5. Third floor. He's the only one currently occupying the building, aside from the landlord. The others, they moved out due to noise complaints. And what am I looking for? A little black gym. I think the guy keeps it in his hallway somewhere. Don't bring it back to me, though. I don't have a use for it, nor do I want it. You can keep it if you like. I just need it out of this little shithole. He took a pause, breathed heavily, and exploded into a series of coughs. I took a day to scout the place out and find a way to get in. I drove around until I found the place. It was the ugliest thing I'd ever seen in my life. 
The outside was covered in graffiti and the sign was barely legible. I could tell without getting out of the car that I wouldn't be able to go in from the front door. There was no way I was walking up the stairs without the landlord confronting me. A man walked out of the building. He wore a navy blue hoodie and sweatpants and walked stiffly, as if he were dying from terminal illness or something. I got out of the car and walked around the building. At the back was a rusty metal fire escape that ran down the back of the building like a decaying spinal cord. There was my way in. I could climb up the stairs, climb in through the window, and ransack the place. Only problem was I didn't know which room was which. Climbing up the stairs to the third floor, I peered in through the first window. I could faintly see through the dirt caked glass the letters B1 and faded copper on the back of the front door. Going horizontally, I was able to find B5. My way in was covered. All I had to do now was break in tomorrow night. My break in kit was fairly minimal black outfit with a black hoodie, a burlap sack I found to transport the goods, a couple of lock picks, and a baseball bat for protection. Most of you are probably calling me a scumbag and a subspecies of Homo erectus, but it was either stealing shit from people or the homeless shelter. I was back at the Yorker Brewery again. I climbed up the staircase, avoiding the steps that I remembered buckled and creaked under my weight. I reached the window and fit my fingers under the tiny crack. I was going to try and bust the lock open. Usually worked with windows like these. I pushed with all my strength and nearly fell inside. The Muppet left his window unlocked. I ducked in through the window and found myself in his living room. It was empty except for a sofa and a CRT television. My eyes widened as I took my baseball bat and I saw a figure in the corner, hidden by the shadows. We stared at each other for a minute. I then realized that it was just a mannequin turned to face the window I entered. It was made of shiny plastic and completely black. What do you need a mannequin in your living room for? To my right was a hallway with two doors on either side. At the end of the hallway was a squat little nightstand, and on top, out in the open, was the gym. Little was an understatement. This thing was almost as big as my fist. Bent low, I progressed through the hallway. I reached one door and put my ear to it. Nothing. Did the same with the next one. The owner was in there, snoring and coughing loudly in his sleep. In another five minutes, I was ducking out of the window with the gym in my sack. Even though it was bigger than I expected, it still weighed more than it let on. It would be going somewhere safe in my house till I could find a buyer. Next morning, I was back in the Starbucks. The old man walked inside and handed me the cash and sat down with me to talk about the job. Everything went well? He asked. Yeah, man. Walked in, walked out, took the gym with me, I replied. Good, good. Where'd you find it? The guy looked at me dead in the eye. He looked healthier, as if he was getting more sleep than before. Guy left it out in the open, right in the hallway, exactly like you said. He even left the window open. You wouldn't believe it. He chuckled. He got up and laid his hand on my shoulder. Well, thanks, son. You did me a mighty favor. Take care of yourself, all right? I walked out of the Starbucks with more than a thousand dollars in my pocket, as well as the gym back at my place. This guy even bought me coffee, and I finished the last of it as I got back into the car. The next night, I got into bed and turned the light off. I was in a trance-like state for about 15 minutes, before I was jolted awake by a shrill, continuous beep, like the aftermath of an explosion right beside your ear. I looked around my bedroom for the source but I climbed back into bed empty-handed and tried to sleep, which I managed at 1 a.m. The next few nights, the noise increased steadily in volume, until the third night I could identify it. It sounded just like a young girl screaming, just screaming, forever. It got worse from then. Every night the sound would be there, looming over me, sending stabs of pain into my head. On the tenth night, the sound was so loud it sounded like it was coming from right beside my ear. I turned over to look. Ten seconds later, I was locking my room from the outside. It was the mannequin from the apartment. It had been stooping over me, peering into my eyes. There was a huge, gaping depression where its mouth should have been. The next five minutes, I stood outside my room, hyperventilating. The thing, still screaming, had begun to thump violently on my door, so hard that it rattled in its hinges. 
I don't know what to do. I buried my face in my hands until I remembered the gym. I dashed downstairs into the basement to get to my vault, entering the code and snatched the gym and then, half naked, ran outside into my car. The thing had stopped thumping and sounded much closer. It had gotten out. I drove like the wind, crossing red lights and charging down one-way streets the wrong way until I got to the river. I parked close to the edge, took one final look at the fist-sized gym in my hand, and chucked it out the window, and didn't drive away until I heard the splash. When I got back to my house, the thing was gone, and the bedroom door had been thrown clean off its hinges. The last three nights have been utter bliss. Three full nights of rest. This morning, I woke up feeling elated. I got up to a sitting position and froze. At the end of my bed, arms outstretched and mouth wide open, making no sound, was the mannequin. At my feet lay the black gem. I've tried to break it. I've tried to lose it in different places. I even drove across three states to get rid of it. Nothing works. It just delays. It appears the only way to get rid of it is to have someone take it. Please... If anything looks too good to be true, be cautious, especially if it's breaking into someone's house, because you never know what may break out with you. I need sleep. I have the power to know everything. Most of you would call it a power, or an ability, or a gift. I'd call it a curse. I'm not a god, I'm quite the opposite actually. If you had a crowd of 50 people, you wouldn't be able to tell me apart from all the others. I'm pretty sure I've had this, well, this ability my entire life. I only started to realize what it actually was when I was 13 years old, give or take a year. I was nearly on the verge of tears while midway through my biology examination. I remember the question clearly. What was the name of the fine hairs that bacteria used to propel themselves? I was a stupid kid. I remember my head was heating up like a microwave machine as I struggled to reel in the answer from the depths of the study sessions and all-nighters. I forced myself to calm down and ask myself the question, what was the name of the fine hairs that the bacteria used to propel their insignificant little bodies? I thought, flagellum. I just froze. I didn't think that. That was not my inner voice. That just spoke to me. It was feminine in a way. Spoke each word coldly and clipped, like you would imagine a Wikipedia page would read. I slowly scrolled down the answer on the page. Next question. I read the bold text as I shifted the pencil down. My arm felt dense as steel. Name the substance which makes up the cell wall of the bacterium. Peptoglycan, commonly known as Marin, said the voice. The knowledge trickled through my neurons like a glass of ice-cold water. I aced the exam. Ever since then, that voice has been my guardian angel, guiding me through golden report cards, scholarships, and university opportunities. Of course I had to play it down a little bit, slip up here and there. I remember telling three of my closest friends about my ability. At first they didn't believe me. Then they slowly started to accept my story, but they were still skeptical. I could tell when they believed my story, because they started to hate me. They would go out of their way to make my days hell. I moved cities and moved schools, never saw them again. A few years after, when I began university, I learned that two of them had dropped out, having no will to commit to their education knowing that I was always holding the get-out-of-jail-free card. The third lost the will to live and hung himself in his bedroom. This didn't affect me. The fact that I had ruined three lives indirectly with my ability failed to get me to slow down. I pushed it to the back of my mind and carried on with a successful university career. Back then I realized how far I could go, and I had no intentions of stopping. Sometimes I tried to ask it questions, different questions. Are you sent in? Can you make casual conversation? Not great pickup lines, I know. It didn't respond to those questions. I was left with the blank void of my brain. It did the same thing when I tried to ask it what could be considered impossible questions. 
like what's the nature of the universe or why does it exist is there a god i soon came to realize that it wasn't a person it was just a tool like a database i was a bit disappointed everyone else was just well so vastly inferior to me that it made it hard to make friends of course there was nothing wrong with me after I left university I just kind of drifted around it occurred to me that I really could become anything an engineer a scientist whatever even professions that require effort were feasible all I had to do was ask for the best route and I was set in stone. I was faced with practically infinite choices and I didn't know which one to choose so I took a break, went back to my roots, rented a small apartment, got a job at a local Starbucks to pay the bills, you know, take a step back and look at the big picture right. Ten days ago I nearly lost my life. I didn't look both ways. That day I learned omniscience didn't necessarily mean invincibility. It humbled me a little, the trip to the ICU. I didn't break any limbs, luckily, only a few fractured ribs and bruising. Three days later I was out, bill paid by my parents. Don't worry about them, they're nothing important. Back at home, relaxing on my recliner, I began to wonder. Could my gift predict the future? Maybe it could. It could save me the trouble of breaking a couple of bones. Maybe even help me avoid death. Or, hey, maybe I can make a fortune off of gambling. When will I die? I asked. I waited. Five seconds passed. Ten seconds passed. I sighed dud question. It probably couldn't predict the future. Then, seven days. I started shaking uncontrollably. I couldn't stop. I kept on mumbling beneath my breath. What the hell? What the hell? I think I had a mental breakdown. I don't remember. All I remember is black nothingness interspersed with episodes of crying, falling to the ground, and hyperventilating. Eventually, I just drifted off. I woke up the next morning. I would slept for 15 hours. There was only six days left till I died. Walking to work, I calmed myself down, closed my eyes, asked a question. How will I die? Waited a minute, nothing. I tried another approach. Who would kill me? Five minutes, nothing. I grew desperate. What is the name of fine hairs bacteria use to propel themselves? I waited ten minutes. Ten minutes gave way to thirty minutes. Thirty minutes turned into an hour. I was reduced to tears again. I sat on the curb. Tears flowing down my face. People passed by. Some looked at me with contempt on their faces. Some flash looks of sympathy. I looked like a homeless man. And that was probably what I would be. I built my life around my ability. Some part of my mind broke that night, knowing that I was about to die. And now it was gone. Everything went down the drain with it. I never studied. Barely knew what I was jolting down on those papers. A glimmer of hope cut through the gloom. No, I still had a life. I could keep my job at Starbucks, work my way up. Still lead a humble life. I picked up myself and forced myself to walk to work. At work, I apologized to my boss for arriving more than an hour late. I started my shift with other workers I'd come to know. It fell apart within the hour. I was paranoid, with reason. They were out to kill me, all of them. I caught Shelb sizing me up through the corner of his eyes. 
Cassandra always passed behind me on her way to the coffee machines. All of the customers I tried to serve stared straight at my heart. I was going to die here. On my fifth customer, I decided to make a break for it. There was no way through the entrance. There was too many of them. They would swarm me. I would die. I had to find another way. I made a break for the employees only section, grabbing a fork on the way to the door. Shell grabbed me. What's... R the fork was in my hand. Then it was inch deep in his jugular. I was running before he hit the ground. I ran from the screams. They were after me now. I burst through the back entrance and kept running. I could already hear the police sirens wailing like banshees. I would not die. I could not die. That was six days ago. With the little money I had, I dyed my hair blonde, bought some new clothes, and rented the cheapest apartment I could find. I can't go outside now. They're all after me, like a pack of bloodhounds. I won't die by their rules. I know that some of you aren't like them. You don't want to kill me. Not everyone wants to kill me. That would be insane, right? The rope is ready. Elder holds a cigarette between her fingers, blowing a puff of smoke into the chilly night air. She glances at the cancer stick with a minor look of shame and disgust. I really ought to quit these things, she tells herself quietly, as she tosses it to the ground. Her large platform boots crush it with a minor amount of force. She sighs quietly to herself and pushes a strand of her lilac hair out of her hazel eyes. Elder uses her black painted nails to scratch at the freckles on her nose and cheeks. A trait that would make sense if people knew her natural hair colour was ginger, though not like it really mattered, since it seemed that few people paid attention to this small detail. Her hand absent-mindedly pulls a thread at the hem of her tank top, whilst the other pulls at the bottom of her tartan skirt. It wasn't like Elder to wear clothes like this, but her friends had encouraged it. They had dragged her out tonight for some party, and then ditched her halfway through. A rather strange sight, however, interrupted her pitiful thoughts. A few feet away from her stood a little boy with dark coloured hair and dark eyes. He seemed to stare into Edna's soul with his unblinking gaze. She shivers slightly and turns her attention more fully to her little admirer. Why are you staring at me like that, kid? The little boy takes a few steps towards her. Why is your hair purple? Elder couldn't help but smile at the innocence of the question. It wasn't something she was used to, as she rarely ventured outside her home. Having a well-paying job online can do that for you. Well, she began, whilst tossing another strand out of her eyes. I dyed it to look like this, because I like it. Purple is my favourite colour. The idea of this seemed to fascinate the boy, who took another step towards her. And why are you dressed like that? he asked. Admittedly, this question caught Elder off guard, more than the last one at least. I don't usually wear these clothes, but my friends wanted me to wear it for a party. The boy looked around for a moment, a confused look crossing his face. Where are your friends? Elder laughs quietly to herself, trying to think of an appropriate way to tell the child that her friends had ditched her. Well, 
They had to meet up with someone and decided to leave me behind. Of course, the details were more risque than this, but that was not knowledge a boy should be hearing. A sad look came onto the boy's face. They're not very good friends then, are they? He remarks it with a bit of a whine, and Elder seems to consider the statement for a moment, before slowly nodding in agreement. I suppose you're right, she says. But they're the only friends who will talk to me. The boy perks up like a flower on a sunny morning for a moment, interested in the meaning behind Elder's words. Why? The question instantly made her nervous. She wasn't sure how to go about answering this. Most people don't like me, she says, slowly and deliberately. Again, the boy repeats his question. He was far too young to really understand why most people would walk on the other side of the street when seeing a girl like her. Arguably, it was a refreshing change. Finally, Elder sighs and sits down on the bench, close to where she was standing. I don't quite know, she admits. Just something about me makes most people scared. They act as if I'm a monster. The boy smiles wide and goes to sit next to her. Well, I don't think you're a monster. I think you're really nice and pretty. Elder blushes a bright shade of pink. Pretty? Me? She thinks to herself. Just the thought made her feel embarrassed. And to think it was being said by a child. What did she have to be embarrassed about? Thank you, she tells the boy quietly. But before the boy could say anything else, a nervous-looking woman crosses the corner, her hair dishevelled and her clothes dirty. Once she sets her eyes on the boy, a smile crosses her face. But that smile quickly fades when her eyes set on Elder. Henry, get away from it right this instant, she yells to the boy. Henry looks sadly at the woman. Why, mother? She's just been talking to me, that's all. Henry's mother ignores his pleas and drags him by the arm away from Elder, who was just watching sadly from a distance as she slowly fades away. As he was being dragged, Henry lays eyes on a small memorial plaque placed by a lamppost. Alongside notes and stuffed toys was a picture of Elder, lilac hair covering her hazel eyes and freckles. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I would like to extend a huge thank you to all the collaborators for helping me out on this video. If there are any narrators in particular that you enjoyed, please be sure to check them out with the links provided in the description. I'd love to know which of these pastors were your favourites, so please be sure to let me know in the comments section below. What I really would appreciate above all else though, is if you could please smash that like button and subscribe as you won't want to miss what I have in store for you next. And if you have had a creepy or paranormal experience that you wish to share, feel free to send it to my email which you can find in the description. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter, at The Mortis Media, for some secret stuff you won't find anywhere else. But anyway, for now guys I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome! And I'll see you in the next one.